Deputy Mary Lou Macdonald, please. So, um, Gurumila Mahagut, Keon Korla, and uh, I am particularly pleased to take to my feet here in the Dáil for this uh, second stage debate on the Regulation of Termination of Pregnancies Bill uh, 2018. You know, for a very long time, uh, I would not have imagined that uh, this legislation would actually materialise, much less that I would be a parliamentarian uh, speaking here in, in the Dáil on it. So I want to welcome the opportunity to contribute. I want to underscore the importance of this legislation, the, its importance to past, to present and to future generations of women and our families cannot be overstated. Count Corda, for decades, thousands of our women faced a lonely and traumatic journey to Britain and Wales to access abortion services. The shame imposed on these women and girls by the church, by politicians, by conservative elements right across Irish society was wrong and it was cruel. Since 1983, momentum against the deeply oppressive Eighth Amendment to the Constitution grew in scale and in support. And in truth, repeal was a campaign decades in the making. And with, as with so many other big social changes, a long and arduous journey is often followed by very rapid social adjustment and change. And so, as is often the case when it comes to civil and human rights, the truth is that the people led and the politicians followed. And I want to take this opportunity again to sound out my admiration and appreciation of all of those activists, women and men, north, south, east and west, who were to become together for yes. To all of those who fought the good fight and who led from the front. For young activists for whom this may have been their first big political campaign, can I commend their youthful advocacy, their optimism, their energy and their vision for their country. To the veterans, if I can use that term, to people who for decades had taken a stand for women, for our bodily integrity, for our right to choice, for our right to health care, for our right to safety in our maternity hospitals, can I commend them too? Because there is no doubt for a very long time those advocates and campaigners walked a very, very lonely path. And I know for them and for our youthful advocates, the introduction of this leg legislation is momentous. And we divide on many things in this doll, and I would be, as you know, last count Corla, very often and quite rightly a critic of the current administration. I want to commend them, I want to commend this government for bringing forward this legislation. On the 25th of May this year, 1,429,981 people voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment from the Irish Constitution. And yet today women will still travel to Britain for an abortion. And their journey will still be unduly harsh despite the collective support expressed to them by the Irish people. So members of the Oireachtas now have a dual responsibility to these women. We must ensure that abortion services are available in Ireland from January of next year and that this legislation vigorously upholds those fundamental rights that people voted for in May last. We must continue to hear the concerns raised by women, by their families, by the medical profession on the shortfalls 
of this legislation. We should be open to a constructive and informed conversation. We should be open to amendments that will strengthen the Act in the interests of women and in the interests of the medical practitioners who care for them. This legislation will shape abortion services in Ireland for decades to come. And in practical terms, this is a new strand to health care delivery. So we have to get it right. This legislation will require very, very careful thought and deliberation at second stage, but more crucially when this legislation goes to committee. At committee stage, it is my hope that all members will have a capacity to listen to, to comprehend and to translate expert opinion, be it medical opinion or otherwise. I hope at committee, if it proves necessary or useful and helpful, that the experiences of women, again, would be considered as we craft the legislation. I know that in the course of the debate on repeal, the experiences of women and their families, for example, faced with the fatal fetal anomaly, was absolutely crucial and critical in setting the tone of the debate and the deliberation. I think that it is so important that real human experiences don't get lost in a technical exercise of legislative text and amendment. To get it right, we have to act in good faith and with goodwill. And I know that there are different views on the issue of abortion across this House, and I respect that very, very deeply. But we also know collectively that the people have spoken. And when the people repealed the Eighth Amendment, they didn't do so in a vacuum of knowledge. The debate was in fact well informed. The debate created light as well as heat. And in the course of the debate, Irish public opinion was aware of the general shape of the legislation that would follow. So as we debate and deliberate, and as democratically elected officials, as we put forth our view on our own behalf, but on behalf of our constituents, I believe goodwill demands that the legislation is allowed to proceed. Las Corla, I am asking very, very simply that we have a full, deliberative and frank debate but I'm appealing to colleagues not to abuse the rules and regulations and latitude of the Houses of the Oireachtas to delay and delay and delay legislation which already carries the democratic imprimatur and approval of the Irish people. I think it's important that we assure, ensure that every woman, and I want to include in these this trans persons, those who identify as non-binary. And for some of us, for some people, these are new concepts and new terms. But let me say these are very real human beings. That for every woman, wherever they live, or whatever their income level, that they can ex access services equally. So there are a number of specific areas within the legislation that I believe uh, demand some further attention and I would like to refer briefly last count Corla to them. Section 13 of the bill provides for a consideration or wait, waiting period of three days from whence a medical practitioner certifies a woman for a termination to when she can receive it. I'm conscious last count Corla that last month Doctors in evidence to the Health Committee described the three-day waiting period as unnecessary and they told us that it didn't have a medical rationale. The decision to impose this provision within the legislation is therefore perhaps more political than medical. Perhaps we might reflect 
that it is a product of a paternalistic mindset and of governments and legislative drafters of old. A mindset that we had hoped had been set aside. I think this provision has to be considered very, very carefully. We have to ask ourselves as to whether it will prove a barrier to women, for example, living in rural Ireland, or indeed to women living in the north of Ireland who will have to access services for the time being across the border. The Minister and his Cabinet colleagues know that many women will not feel comfortable seeking medical care very close to home. The people may have voted to repeal the Eighth Amendment, but let's be realistic that stigma still exists. So I want this provision to be considered and weighed very, very thoughtfully. I want to refer also to the offences section at the front of the bill. I want to note that this features ahead of the sections dealing with medical care and say that that bothers me. The offences section can and will create a chilling effect. The message to women's doctors is that criminal sanctions must be their first concern and perhaps the care of the woman secondary. That can't happen and any impression to that effect must be set to rest. And I can't imagine that that would be something that would sit well with government. My colleague, Deputy Louise O'Reilly, has outlined Sinn Féin's view that we don't agree that medical professionals who invoke a conscience clause can be exempt from referring a patient for the necessary medical tra treatment that they seek. The medical profession have raised a number of additional concerns with the Minister regarding the legislation and they must be listened to. We now have an opportunity to address associated areas of medical care and I welcome the Minister's commitment that abortion services will be provided free of charge. This commitment must be extended to women living in the north of Ireland who continue to be denied fundamental rights secured here in Ireland and in Britain. It's time to consider equitable access to contraception for women and girls. These too must be free of charge. The Committee on the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution recommended the introduction of a scheme to provide contraception free of charge to all people who wish to avail of it within the state. The Committee voiced a particular concern that personal costs of contraception can be prohibitive. They acknowledged a finding of the CSO General Population Survey in 2010 where 18% of respondents found the cost of contraception to be an issue. The discriminatory language of the legislation I think also must be addressed. The trans community played an important role in the repeal campaign as did non-binary people. And as communities who campaigned alongside each other for the varied rights the state has historically denied us, our struggles are interwoven. The language of this bill needs to reflect the diversity of society and must be absolutely inclusive in its intent. So I urge the Minister to reflect on the demands made by transgender and non-binary actives and medical professionals for the inclusion of gender-neutral language. If this matter is not addressed now, we know that it will be addressed in the future after long campaigning for a right that we already know that these people are entitled to. I want to conclude by commending the appointment of Dr Peter Boylan to assist in the implementation of arrangements for termination of pregnancy and related services. Dr Boylan has been a tremendous champion for women's health care and I'm sure during the repeal campaign at some considerable personal cost. We are eternally grateful to all the medical practitioners who campaigned alongside us, to the Irish abroad who supported us, to women who shared their deeply personal stories so that wider society could truly understand the cruelty of the Eighth Amendment, and to the new generation of activists that have emerged. The final act must reflect the rights secured by the people earlier this year.